that. So this one is going to be about uh, overpowering your players. So in uh, in my Curse of Strahd game, where I'm playing that uh, Zealot Barbarian, he, uh, the DM is extremely liberal with magic items, bonuses, boons, all that stuff. So as a result, um, my level 6 Barbarian has... He took the Slasher Feet at level 4. That's the only one he took normally, like per normal rules. Then, for f story reasons and you know, narrative stuff, we've gotten he's gotten the sentinel feet, and he's gotten the tough feet. He's level 6. So he's got 83 HP. And, item-wise, he's gotten a, uh, effectively a flame tongue great axe. But it does necrotic damage, and it's a scythe, blah blah blah. Um, so, big damage boost there. He's gotten Bracers of Defense but very early. You know, this is a, a common enough level to get Bracers of Defense. And then he's also gotten, which is the big one, a Belt of Fire Giant Strength. So this Barbarian has a Strength of 25. And as a result, I have a to hit bonus of plus 11 at level 6 now. So it's very easy for me to hit stuff. I have massively boosted HP thanks to the tough feet. I do extra damage with the flame tongue, or the necrotic tongue, we'll call it, the great axe. So his damage right now is actually without great weapon. Like if this was a quote normal game without all these magic items, his damage is like higher considerably than a standardized great weapon master barbarian factoring into hit bonuses and stuff, how often you'll hit, those types of stuff, or those types of things. Um, so, a good deal more damage, like tons of math, we were making jokes about that, that, you know, and also he's a zealot barbarian, so all of his attack rolls look like, okay, there's the physical, there's the slashing damage, okay, here's the necrotic damage, okay, here's the radiant damage. Like doing all this math, everyone else just rolls a few dice. I'm like, okay, it's this much. Okay, it's that much. All right, that's it. And I'm like, all right. Okay, that's 60 damage this turn. Um, so, point is, uh, my character is very, very potent, and everybody's character is like this. When my character got the belt of fire giant strength. Our warlock got illusionist bracers. The every warlock's ultimate desire. <laughs> so this our warlock is an eldritch machine gun or a green flame blade cantrip machine gun. <laughs> our cleric got our cleric got a, uh, a Tome of Wisdom, and I think a few other things here and there. I don't know exactly what items our Cleric has, but they're extremely potent too. And as a result, they were originally billed as a more offensive kind of Cleric, built that way. But they're coming to realize they sort of can't keep up with the Hexblade and the Barbarian, so maybe it is better to just go into a more supporting one and attack when they can, because spiritual weapon is always fun to throw out, but <clears throat> maybe they can just be more supporting and have a bigger impact that way, like, you know, always casting protection from good and evil on the barbarian, things like that. Um, our druid got both a staff of the woodlands, which if you don't know what that item is, it's it's a staff, and it lets you do two, two main things. Um, first, it gives you the ability to cast Pass Without Trace at will. 
No, so, one, you don't have to have it on your spell list. And you don't have to spend spell slots on it. You can always just cast it. Like, if you're not actively concentrating on something else, pass it out trace. <laughs> like, it's just up. Who cares? And then it also gives you... Actually, just three things. It also gives you access to a bunch of spells that you can cast a few times per day with charges. And I don't remember, like... It's like Awaken is on that list. There's a bunch of stuff on that list. And then it also gives you the ability to plant the staff in the ground and it turns into a 60 foot tree. It doesn't really do anything else, but it's a tree. It's, we, uh, our druid used it once, like once for like scouting purposes to get like a bird's eye view. And that was really funny, but you know, you gotta get creative and stuff like that. But, um, and like got the druid got something like that and they got a cloak of invisibility so our healer druid is now much more able to stay out of sight and avoid being targeted and because they're a goblin druid they can if need be they can activate the cloak as an action and then hide as a bonus action now that they're invisible they can hide just it, and they probably have passed without trace up. So our druid is like the sneakiest motherfucker ever now, <laughs> and is able to effectively utilize stealth in combat. And like a combat encounter we had last night, which was four ogre zombies and a revenant, which I think is like on. They're like CR2s, like four CR2s, and then a, I don't know what CR a Revenant is. It probably wasn't like a super challenging encounter, but it was probably at least medium, because we were level five at the time. But we just, we kind of took that combat apart through the use of a spike growth to do a bunch of passive damage to all the ogres and restrict their first turn so that they would have to dash out of it to, to uh, get into range. Because they didn't have range options anyway. So they would dash out of the spike growth, take a bunch of extra damage, where our barbarian and warlock are waiting to just cut, literally cut them down. Uh, turn down the air conditioning. I don't know if that's if uh, that was messing with the sound too much. I mean, all these videos lately, I have the air conditioning on. Um, but the ogres shredded themselves just getting up to the barbarian. My barbarian's first turn, he almost killed this one ogre that the the warlock then popped like a zit on the next turn, and then my barbarian's next turn, he quickly killed two remaining ogre zombies. One was left. It got turned by the cleric, so it ran back into the spike growth and cheese grated itself into nothingness. Then the revenant was left. It tried to teleport away, got counterspelled by the, by, by the warlock, paralyzed my barbarian. It's like, oh, something bad happened. Uh, and then it took like it was, that was its turn, and then combat went around again, and then the next turn, it tried to teleport out and avoided the counter spell and dipped. So we kind of trivialized that encounter. Not that it was going to be, like, really that hard, but it got demolished. Oh, and I didn't even mention the new character that joined our group, the, uh, and another goblin artillerist artificer. So... We had even more ranged support, and I don't even know what magic items that guy has. Uh, assuming he'll probably start getting some cool stuff. But, the point is, our party is very, very potent. All the characters are very strong. And, on top of that, we are very well-rounded as well. We have two... Um, two, like, kind of hybrid characters, the Warlock and the Cleric, can they can dip into the front line if they need to, the way they're built. Um, they, can take some, they can take some damage, 
They can do melee stuff. They can do range stuff if they need to. The Barbarian is obviously out in the front lines and utilizing the Sentinel feet and the Slasher feet. He can reduce enemies' movement, give them disadvantage on attack rolls if he crits. You know, that's not super reliable, but it's a thing. Um, on top of just doing heaps of damage. And then you've got the, the Druid that's like running around and either doing control control effects to limit enemies or healing if need be, and you've got the Artillerist Artificer who's now going to just be blowing things up, our party is very capable, and we're not really missing a whole lot of stuff. Um, maybe we're missing the, like, actual uh, area of effect blaster goal, but we've got so much, like, single target damage, maybe we don't need that. And then I think both the Warlock and the Artillerist can dip into that role if need be. They have ways to do that. But the point is, the, the main thing I'm getting at after gushing about the party this whole time is what happens or the effects of having a really, really powerful party like this. And there's kind of two, like, there's two main takeaways. One is that a lot of these things might stretch certain mechanics, particularly, like, the tough feet. Like, yeah, you've got a lot more health, but with the tough feet that gives you this extra 2 HP per level, you don't get extra hit die along with it. So, while you have more HP effectively at the start of the day, you don't have as much resources during the day to recoup. So, if you really want to stretch the perception of it, it's almost like having temporary HP that refreshes at the start of the day, but that's not a great analogy. It's just you don't have as many internal healing resources, so you might have to rely more on potions and other things. You can't rely on your hit die as much. Not that anybody uses hit die. <laughs> what is this? It's 2022. Two, nobody uses hit die anymore. Um, but that is a factor, right? That is something to consider, that your hit die now don't go as far effectively because, like, under normal conditions, you know, your hit die roughly equal the amount of health you have. Whereas if you have the tough feet, you have other things that give you more HP, the hit die will no longer cover that. So that's a factor. Um, and, of course, the other factor is encounter building. If your party is stronger than their levels and normal CR calculations uh, dictate, well, the DM has some dressing up to do. Monsters have to do more damage. They have to hit more often. They have to have more attacks. They have to have better armor classes. You know, all these things. But also, if you're a homebrew happy DM, then this gives you all sorts of cool stuff you can play around with. Like, you know, the simple idea of you've got a Warforged Paladin with plus one plate who's got an and learned shield somewhere, and he can, get, he can get his AC up to 27. How do you deal with that? Well, maybe in certain combats you have, I don't know, dedicated, instead of just having all the enemies have higher to hit bonuses so you can get the paladin or high AC target more often. Well, you can target that character saves. And if it's a paladin with high charisma, well, those are going to be high too, and that's a separate issue. But maybe you do have an enemy or two that do have extremely high to hit chances, or they can do things like give themselves advantage, like lots of enemies with like the Vengeance Paladin's Vow of Enmity Channel Divinity type thing, where you, they can point at the Paladin and go, you are the guy I'm gonna fuck up. And now they get advantage on attack rolls versus them. And the Paladin gets to take this, like, gets to embody that, like, tanking role that he's the dude in the front lines and he's parrying everybody and everybody's attacking him and he can live that life. But he's doing it with this incredibly powerful foe in this one-on-one -on -one duel situation. 
that can be super cool. Or he gets ganged up on by a bunch of rats with pack tactics that have reasonable hit, hit bonuses, but there's fucking seven of them. And they're all attacking the paladin. You know, there's ways to get around this. And you, like, it doesn't have to be just, oh, you give all the dudes big to hit bonuses. No, you give them cool contextual stuff. Like, you know, you've got one or two guys that have, say, there's a cleric in the back. Like a dark cleric in the back that has uh, all of his spells. He's just firing guiding bolts at the, cleric, at the paladin. And he gets some sort of contextual bonus. Like maybe he's got three uses of War God's Blessing uh, that he can use on himself to get a plus 10 bonus to his attack rolls on those guiding bolts. So he can, and he's only gonna use them on the paladin. So that he's always shooting the, the party paladin with that so that all of the other minions can get advantage on attacking him. That has some contextual value and strategic value and spectacle value. This is some stuff I've talked about in other videos. Give monsters some spectacle. It also potentially gives the party an, uh, an avenue to play around with this. If they can stop that cleric from doing this thing, or if they can stop that one dueling knight from doing his vow of enmity on the paladin and singling him out, well, now he's not going to be as effective. And that's the thing. If your party comes up with a cool way to circumvent enemy strengths, let them do it. But give enemies these cool cons contextual strengths to get around a really powerful party like this. Um, for example, the um, like going back to the my curse of Strahd party, the path the uh, cleric, not the cleric, the warlock has a eldritch machine gun. He's he can fire heat they sorry can fire. Um, Eldritch Blast, two shots is an action, and then bonus action, two more shots. That's effectively a free action, action surge all the time. Well, how can you bait a character like that and give them interesting things to do? Well, in certain en uh, encounter compositions, you can have a bunch of like low HP flying enemies so that the Warlock can shoot them down. And maybe that can occupy the Warlock's time so that they don't burst down this like single big target that now the, the Barbarian has to deal with kind of on his own, which he can totally do. But maybe that's the thing. Like you give them like, a lot of the time, a less strategic party is going to um, like split their focus too much. Whereas ideally, you want to all focus on a single target and kill that target dead to eliminate it from the action economy, to el like eliminate it from the initiative. So that like every tur enemy turn you can get rid of is a big point in your favor. That is giving you more and more advantage um, like numbers wise, strategic advantage, that type of stuff. So if you can force the party to split their focus, like if it's a smart party, like this party is, we act strategically, we focus down single targets. So if you can force the warlock to make decisions like that, and it's like, okay, these imps are up there throwing, say like throwing damage types at the barbarian that he doesn't resist. They have to be got taken care of now. Otherwise, the Barbarian is going to lose too much HP too quickly. So, that's a way of working together with your other players. Like, oh, he's in danger from these things. Because these little imps throwing fireballs, like little fire blasts at the, at the Barbarian, is going to hurt him too much. So, we got to take care of those that kind of idea. And, you know, there's a million ways to set up an encounter like this with different enemy designs and stuff. Like, maybe instead of, like, a big dude that the barbarian has to fight, and then flying imps that are just pelting everyone with fire, maybe instead there's a... there's less, like, more potent flying enemies with, like, bows. Like, it's a, like it's a bunch of 
uh, Aracocra Rangers or something, and they're flying around and shooting bugs at the party. Well, some of the party is fine in this combat. Like, it doesn't really matter options-wise. Like, the... The Hexblade can just fire Eldritch Blasts at them, fight them just fine. The Cleric can shoot, can throw cantrips and other stuff. The um, the Artillerist is just going to shoot them. Um, but the Barbarian is just kind of standing there on the ground. And he's like, I'm going to throw Javelins, I guess. And if those Aracocra are even 20 feet off the ground, well, now the Barbarian's going to have a hard time even just throwing Javelins. So maybe you give a specific kind of mechanic that these, um, if you do enough damage to these flying guys, they'll drop and then the barbarian can demolish them. That kind of idea. Um, and, you know, you can set up combats like this, say, and you know, a strategic party like this is going to learn. Like say, early on, and, you know, this is just general advice, but it's always good to work these types of things out. Um, you know, early on, say, there's a, a fight like this, and the main point of the fight is figuring out that if you can do enough damage of a certain type, or cause a drop prone effect or something, just hit them hard enough to make them break concentration, they'll drop out of the sky, something like that. Or they'll drop low enough. For the barbarian to attack them, you know, they'll have to figure this out. And then later on, if there's a similar encounter, they might pick up and remember that, oh yeah, this was a mechanic from an earlier fight. Maybe this one will work similarly. But of course, the context, the context of that fight is going to be different in a variety of ways. Like who knows exactly how. Oh, this liquor store is open. Interesting. Um, and, you know, maybe it's going to be different in a variety of other ways. Maybe in addition to, like, some flying enemies, there's enemies that are, like, in water pools or something, and they pop out and shoot and drop down, so you have to use more ready actions. Like this, you know, you can... Once you establish a mechanic in one fight, you can remix it and use it and blend it with other mechanics in combat design. Um, and this is a big thing to take, you can take away from any video game. Um, any, like, combat-focused video game is going to do stuff like this. You fight a single enemy that has a specific type of mechanic that you have to deal with. And you're like, okay, you learn the mechanic, you scrape by, you kill that enemy just barely. And then the next level, or the next... And then you fight normal enemies, and then you fight two of those guys or something. And it's like, ah, oh, shit. Okay. Uh, well, his mechanic was like charging an attack, like dodging one of his big slow attacks, and then charging this move to break his armor. And that's fine if there's one of them, but if there's another guy, I have to really pick my moments, and it's going to be a lot harder to time. Okay, great. And then instead, then, like, the third fight, there's just one of them again, but there's a bunch of fast guys that do, like, really low damage, but, like, high stagger values. So you're going to have a really hard time, like, getting enough time without being punched to charge that big attack. So, okay, how do you deal with that? Well, either you set up some defenses to negate those attacks, or you kill all those fast guys first. You know, especially any time there's an encounter with um, multiple solutions, great, fantastic, that is what you want. Because, one, if the players can surprise you even a little bit, you're going to have more fun, they're going to have more fun. And you're going to be more excited and energized to design more interesting encounters in the future. Um, like the, for, uh, this mission two of site 27, I designed an encounter where there were a bunch of these like organ banks on the walls that the boss was using kind of in place of legendary actions. And the party could, it could attack those organs to reduce the boss's options. 
And they didn't have to. They could have all just ganged up on the boss and killed him first. Um, there would have been... That would have been the more difficult brute force option, but they could do it. Instead, they very quickly realized, like, oh, there's these organ systems, we should get rid of them. And one of the players in the party figured out, oh, there's a bank of hearts. We know the heart enemies can heal themselves, revive targets, do stuff like that. So, which is a mechanic I showed in an earlier fight. So, the, uh, the cleric who has this uh, homebrew necrotic cantrip figured that out and uh, started attacking the hearts. And earlier, without really planning for this moment, I just gave the hearts uh, vulnerability to necrotic damage. I didn't do it specifically because the cleric had this cantrip, but I could have. That would have been a fine reason to do so. Instead, I just wanted to give all the different organs different vulnerabilities and let the players kind of sort it out. And that's like halfway to that emergent design I talked about in an earlier video. But that's, that's the crux of it. You want emergent design. You want to be surprised by your players and let your players be surprised by the enemies. And I feel if you've got a really strong party, a really potent party, which also in our Ugliest Man Alive campaign, we've got the same thing going on because we have um, a, like a kind of, we have a unique uh, point buy. So we've got a little more stats to start with. And at ASI levels, you get ASIs and defeat. You don't have to choose. So, we're more powerful than we otherwise would be. But, oh, sorry, it's already going too fast. Um, but, with a strong party like that, that has a lot of options to fall back on, you can make really strong enemies that have, but you just have to be a little creative. It can't just be high HP, high damage, high to hit values, high AC. You gotta, like, as long as you're a homebrew capable DM, like you're confident in designing stuff, then uh, I have confidence in you to come up with cool shit for your monsters to do. But if you're not as confident in doing that, then that's no trouble either. If you're not as confident in designing homebrew stuff and giving monsters cool contextual stuff to do, then maybe dial it back and avoid having really strong players, really strong characters. But that's up to you, and you'll, whoever you are, you'll find that balance um, somewhere. Uh, but I will always, personally, I'll always err towards make players super strong so I can throw super strong, super cool shit at them. Um, yeah, uh, this was a pretty excited rambling, but uh, I like cool shit. It's uh, why I stopped like certain fighting games. I've stopped playing because I felt my characters can't do cool enough shit, so I don't want to play this game anymore. <laughs> uh, so that's about it.